I'm going to show you an incredible scrap from round eight of the European Individual Championship. Daniel Fernandez against Ivan Saric. So Saric on paper, actually one of the favorites in this tournament, but he's somewhere in the middle of the pack. This is, again, I'm featuring uh, another game which isn't right from the top of the uh, tournament standings, but this is really worth looking at, even though it's a London system. But actually, a very interesting position is generated. Let's have a look. So this is one of the starting positions uh, of the London system. Now, I, in one of my DVDs for chess base, I recommended this exchange and then knight h5, and I think that's quite a reasonable continuation. There are, there are many good continuations here for black, um, but knight h5, played by Sharic, and this also has a decent reputation. Bishop g5 is actually the most popular move here. And after f6, because of the potential threat to that knight, normally black plays g6, and I think that's a little bit more comfortable for white, but it's absolutely playable for black. But instead of bishop g5, bishop g3 played after 13 minutes, which suggests to me that Fernandez wasn't entirely um, comfortable in this position, didn't really uh, know what was going on, even though, I mean, knight h, it's surprising, maybe he doesn't play the London system too often, I don't know. I mean, knight h5 is not an unusual move. Bishop g3, I think, is something of a compromise because this nice bishop is exchanged off. However, white, I don't think white is worse here. You know, that rook is on the semi-open file. And this clump of pawns, well, you see this with colours reversed in the, the Slav. Actually, this can be quite strong. Bishop d7. And now a3. A little bit surprising. Um, I mean, I'm not quite sure what's wrong with bishop d3 straight away. Well, I know I after this, after a3, I know what's coming. After c takes, Fernandez wanted to recapture with the c pawn, and so the pawn a3 covers the d3 square, but it, it feels more natural to do without a3 and just go bishop d3. Anyway, white is not worse here. <laughs> I think we can say that it's it's still a very solid position and rook c1 this is all terribly logical and the knight comes to b3 to come in c5 i mean I, th I think the position's about equal so for example if black castled here i don't see anything wrong with that and then knight c5 is logical that could be exchanged off and then more exchanges looks equal but sharic wanted more he played b6 so that that knight now stands on a slightly strange square as obviously it has nowhere to go to. But b6 might shut out the knight but it gives this bishop some room. So bishop a6. Now this knight is useless, it has to be redeployed so it came back again. But at least white has conquered a few light squares here. It's still about equal. Castles looks normal, and then knight b1, and the knight can potentially come in here. But instead of castles kingside, Sharich played f5. Now that's very much in his style. He likes to go for it. He likes to mix up play. It's funny, we saw this pawn structure in the game between um, Korobov and Ponomaryov, and if you remember... Korobov managed to use that e5 square, use the dark squares. The moment this one isn't so clear because uh, the knight and the bishop cover e5, but just watch out, watch what goes on. So it seems to me that bishop b5 is a very logical move to potentially knock out this knight and bring this one in here, but instead knight b1, also very interesting. So it's the knight wasn't doing much on d2, so it redeploys to c3, and then it looks much better. 
castle to knight z3, and now knight a5. So the b5 square is covered by the bishop. And who knows, that knight might be able to hop in here. But now that e5 square is available. Now, it's possible just to exchange that off. I have to say, if, if a knight appeared like that, I would be very tempted just to take it off. And I, I still think the position's about equal after queen e8. It covers lots of very nice squares, actually. But bishop e8 played. So that's already pushing it a little bit, leaving that knight on e5. b4. Okay, this is sort of forcing uh, black to make a decision with the knight. And, and Sharich decides to take here and then play knight c4. And Fernandez doesn't want to live with that knight, so he takes it off. And, I mean, he's, he's playing quite positionally, actually. Exchanging off the the correct pieces, uh, achieving a good knight against bad bishop position. So that knight would very much like to hop to d4, potentially sometimes f4 as well, but d4 feels like the right square. It's still okay for black. Queen c7, for example, and th this is actually quite playable. Lots of exchanges, bishop a4, the rook comes across. More exchanges, should be a draw. Anyway, that's kind of the sensible continuation. Sharich's next move is extraordinary. It is so risky. I think you need to have a, a really special kind of mentality to play this next move. Okay, I'm kind of flagging that that it's it's a pretty extraordinary move, so probably you can guess what black is going to play now. Rook e4, after only six and a half minutes. I mean, this is incredible because this rook just looks so oddly placed here. And even if this is taken, the rook might not be able to get out again. Now, Fernandez plays something that is very pragmatic, actually. He could have tried to something like this. And if that's taken, knight c3, you can see that uh, that rook actually doesn't have any squares. And now this one. And if d4, okay, now it's getting wacky. Obviously, that can't be taken because of the pin. But rook h4, there's another pin here. The pawn is pinned, followed by rook takes. And that should be good for white. But black can try all kinds of interesting things here. A5 I quite like, so with the idea, obviously, of taking here. And after this, that's to stop the rook coming out. Now this is possible because, uh, well, it's not possible to trap that rook straight away because the knight isn't on c3. I mean, this is just highly unclear. Let's go back. So, I mean, that's not the only move to try and somehow exploit the the odd position of this rook but as i said fairly quickly fernandez plays this very pragmatic move rook takes and simply queen c7 so he's thinking yep i'd like the end game because that rook looks absolutely terrible and indeed the end game is very promising for white but queen f6 is not so clear And now, well, now it's uh, White's turn to go a bit crazy. White thinks in for a penny, in for a pound, and grabs the pawn. Could have come back. That's a lot safer. But bishop b5 certainly gives black counterplay. And it looks like this rook is going to emerge. But queen takes a7. Bishop b5. Now it's all kicking off. In fact, I would say the game is now spinning out of control. There's too much going on now. So, for example, queen takes, bishop takes, and then f4. This is incredibly dangerous. And 
all these pieces are coming into play. All the major pieces. Hard to defend that one. White plays knight d4, but black does not need to move that one. Here is where things kick off. f4, giving up the bishop. So if that's taken, then queen takes using this pin. And this is actually winning because black threatens queen takes f2 as well as rook takes e3. So the bishop was taken. And here f takes g3 played. But actually this one is even stronger. And watch out for this. This is incredible. I can imagine Shurich might have overlooked Black's next move. This is absolutely fantastic. Watch this. Rook h5. Brilliant. And if Rook takes Rook, Queen b2, and there is no good defence to, well, one of these checks, and potentially checkmate as well. That's an incredible move, Rook h5. It just clears the way for the queen to come to b2. Absolutely brilliant. Now, where are we? Um, oh, yes, I've just spotted something. I suppose white could castle here. That's a legal move. That's incredible. But I suppose queen h6 must be winning. Yeah, there you go. Double pawns aren't very good because the g-pawn can't move. That's amazing. <laughs> just just realised that. Okay, let, let's go back. So... F takes e3 looks like it's uh, actually winning straight away, but F takes g3 was played. This is still good for black, but it's not quite as clear. Queen f4 is now the strongest move. Queen g5 played. And here white should run with the king. And it's still a bit tricky. I mean, it's very hard for white to survive this. But, uh, well, I'll leave you to explore that one if you wish. But queen takes b6, definitely a mistake. Rook takes e3. Now, if the king comes here, then this breaks through. This is actually winning. So the king came here. Right, over to you. Time for some tea. It's tea time. Cheers, everybody. Um, black to play. What are you going to do? What did Sharich do here? And I suspect that he saw this move um, when he played f takes g3. Rookie one check. Wowzers. That is a wonderful move. So the idea is if king takes, that's check by the way, king takes, queen takes, and queen takes h1. And black is the exchange up with a winning position. So the king moved here, rook takes, and again black is the exchange up. And with the king staggering around the middle, this must be lost. So a nice safe move before embarking on the attack. Some Luft. And that's a pragmatic move. You want to exchange rooks and go on the attack. So Sharich is getting there. And, well, this was very brave. But by this stage, there was nothing left but bravery for white. It was lost. And now the king... Gets chased up here, and obviously that wins the queen. And game over. Um, what imagination Sharich has. I mean, there were some fantastic moves there. All starting with this unbelievable idea, rookie four. I mean, that takes incredible courage to play a move like that, because really the rook can just get completely corralled in the centre. But wow, did it pay off. This was superb stuff, starting with f4. Absolutely brilliant. Great stuff. Um, that win brings 
Sharich to five and a half points. Yeah, he's actually a little way off the lead. So Sharich on five and a half. There's a whole stack of people. In the lead, we still have Anton Korobov with seven points. And then just behind, Alexei Sarana and Benjamin Gladura with six and a half. There are three rounds to go. And it is incredibly tight. Uh, so many players uh, have a chance. There's a stack of players on six as well. Uh, Boris Gelfand is on six, for example. Uh, Jesse Penko on six. Shevchenko. Etienne Bakro. Ponomarov is on six. Anyway, a stack of strong players. So this one, with three rounds to go, is absolutely wide open. Remember, if you're not a subscriber, do click that subscribe button. And if you're not a supporter, then do check out Patreon. Powerplay Chess, uh, patreon.com Powerplay Chess, and do support the channel. We will be very grateful. Thanks for watching.